Hi, today we're going to look at the installation of the Atari ST emulator and how you configure it, create drives, insert disks, that kind of thing. And that's going to form the foundation for a, a series we're going to do on taking an ST from a brand new out of the box experience to a fully configured productivity based desktop environment. So Atari, the emulator is uh, available for free. It's hosted at tuxfamily.org, hotari.tuxfamily.org. Uh, if you go to the download section and then the download area. And here you see all of the releases that they've had of the system for the last quite a lot of years, actually. What's that? 11, 12? 12 years. I have heard some bizarre speculation that it's no longer being maintained. But I mean, there's been two releases in 2022. All right, there's a gap preceding that to 2020, but hey, it's open source software. It gets released at the cadence that the people who are working on it want to release it. So the release we're going to go for is 2.4.1. So if you're watching this and you're not a Mac user, many people aren't, you can also see that you can get a 64-bit Windows version, a 32-bit Windows version, and a Linux version in addition to the Mac OS installer. A word, a word on... Linux, if you're going to install it from there, the Hatari website recommends that you actually check your local package manager like APT or your local app store on KDE or whatever, because it may already be pre-built binaries available or snaps, whatever. That just make the installation experience much more friendly. So definitely recommend you check out that on Linux. If you want the latest and greatest, then you need to come here, though the installation is slightly more complex. Right, I'm going to download the Mac version. Okay, and I'm going to close this. So pull the disk image onto here for now. Open that, and it's as simple as copying the executable into the application folder. And thank you very much. There are readmes in here. There are docs in here. The docs for Hatari are actually awesomely good but we'll probably look at that once we spin the app itself up so we can start atari from the applications folder if i could just find the thing there it is and that will start the emulator hopefully on the right screen screen oh you good thing right first things first the atari st requires a rom to bootstrap the operating system itself is baked into ROMs. Now, the Atari ROMs themselves are still copyright material. So, out of the box, Atari ships with Emutos. Emutos is an open source rewrite of the Trammell operating system, but with none of the Atari copyright code in it. It, it is based on some drivers that were open sourced by, I think, Caldera and Digital Research, but it is an open source product. So it is not TOS, but it's pretty close. We will be talking more about TOS ROMs a little bit in the future, but obviously they can't ship with TOS ROMs. You just have to go off and find them. Right, when we let go, the screen pauses for a while. It's actually seeking the floppy drive to see if you want to boot from floppy. We don't have a floppy installed at the moment, so it's going to come up on the desktop. This desktop that you see here is Actually, the Emutos desktop, if you want to call it that, it's not quite the same as the um, original Atari one. So it's not the vanilla thing you would get from an Atari ROM. And that's that's a reason why you very much might want to use Atari's ROMs. I'll, I'll show you one really good difference. If we we have a built-in shell. So this is going to say it can't find a disk, because normally if, you, if you're running a shell like that, you'd have a disk inserted. But if you come into, here's a, a, a nice little CLI. I go help. Gives you a list of the commands in there. All your basic, basic, basic Unix favorites are in there. Everything from copy, move, chmod, you know, more. It's, it's got enough in there that you can operate without having to do everything through the GUI because the GUI on the Atari was pretty minimal. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about in the configuration series for the ST is actually to get from this to a much better desktop environment that has command lines in Windows, etc. We can exit out of that shop. 
there. That's one difference between Emutos and TOS. So Hitari has two mechanisms for controlling it. If you look at the Mac, there is the Macintosh interface. So if I pull up the menu here for the emulator, I can you know, do resets, I can set preferences, etc. in a very, very nice operating system specific manner. The other way of controlling it is if you press F12 inside the ST, you get up this screen, which allows you to do everything that the native menu system does, just using a, a, a common GUI. So the nice thing about this, of course, is if you run Hitari on Linux or you run Hitari on Windows, it will have the same look and feel to it. I particularly like this. I, I kind of prefer the Mac based one simply because when you do things like file choosers, it has better facilities. But for, you know, for now, we need to know that this exists. So let's use this to configure our main system. So the first thing we're going to select is a machine type. So there's the original ST, the Mega ST, the STE, and the Mega STE. So you know, the ST was the 512 kilobytes of memory. You know, there was the ST which had an external floppy drive, the STF, which had an internal floppy drive, the STFM, which had an internal floppy drive and a TV modulator. I mean, ultimately the STE was where it fetched up. That was the last of the, uh, the ST line before they went to the Falcon and the TT. So the E stands for extended, I believe. There were two, there was the STE, which was 512 and the Mega ST, which was uh, 1024 megabytes or 1024 kilobytes please <laughs> it's a megabyte i was going to give it a gigabyte of memory there that would have been funny right so i'm going to set its ste mode i'm going to go back to the main menu i'm going to go oh i want memory next i think where have the hidden memory memory is here and i'm going to say we want four meg of memory why do we want four Four is enough to give you the best experience when we start doing things like multitasking with Mint or when we do Gemini desktops. And that's a minimum amount. I think all of us back in the day who bought STEs, I think it was the first thing we did was upgraded the memory to four meg, normally using a soldering iron and a lot of bodge wires. The nice thing about an emulator is you just click a button, you've got what you want. Okay, go back to the main menu and then just click OK. Yep, we need to reset to get our new thing. If we look on here, it actually says four megabytes there. And on the uh, status bar at the bottom of the screen, it, it tells you what the configuration is. You can disable that status bar if you wish. I normally do. Now, this is brilliant. We've, we've smashed this and we? we've now got our configuration. So I'm just going to quit out of the app. And then I'm going to go to relaunch the app. And oh, I don't know if you saw that, but we've only got a meg of memory. And we have totally lost our configuration. And that the first few times I ran the simulator, that caught me out so often. It The configuration itself unless you persist it does not persist <laughs> sounds stupid when you say it like that but most systems i'm used to you change the preferences and they just automatically get stored somewhere so let's do the same thing again only this time we'll do it through the uh the pref the actual mac interface just because it's as i said slightly sexier so we're going to have a mega ste we're still sticking with the 68,000. We can certainly, as time goes by, we can change the processor, change the speed, but that will, you have to be aware, potentially impact compatibility with programs. So, you know, if you, if you create an ST that's sort of deviates so far from the original ST's hardware, don't expect games to work. They just, they really won't. So I'm going to have a four megabyte uh, configuration and what else do we want on here i think that'll do for now 
So we have two buttons, load config, save config. Want to guess what they do? I'm going to create a folder on the desktop and I'm going to call this Atari. We're going to save our configuration into there. So we're on the desktop. I'm going to go to Atari and I'm going to call it uh, 4MB SDE. Save that and do OK. Reset. It'll reboot. It'll come back. It's got the four megabytes of stuff. So we're out. We're sorted, aren't we? I mean, that's that's really good. I'm just going to quit out of Atari again. And then I'm going to run it again. And very, very conveniently, it's reset back to the original default configuration. Right. So let's go to preferences again. So the config that it loads is this one, is the Hatari config. If you want to load a separate config, you have to do it every time, I think. I've never worked out a way of telling it to remember the last config. However, the other thing is you can run Atari quite comfortably from the command line and specify all of this. So a little bit of scripting is probably what you're going to end up doing. So another reset, and we're back to what we want. We have our four megabyte listed under TOS, and indeed on the bottom, and there we are. We're up and we're running. So it's just something you have to remember to do. Now, I am going to just make this go to the medium resolution. So we've got a few more pixels. I'm going to save that desktop configuration. So we'll remember that this is, we're doing this really in, um, in the ST. So this isn't an Atari thing. What? Ah, we've got no way to store it. So that very nicely segues from the end of this video to the beginning of the next, when we'll talk about floppy drives and possibly if we get time, we'll start covering hard drives. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching. And I'll talk to you soon.